Okay. You came out, what was now two days ago, and suggested that these tribes should get audited. What was the onus for that? And maybe if you want to tell me a little bit about the reaction you've gotten so far from tribal council members, people living on the reservations. So we have been pretty active in trying to sign law enforcement agreements with all of our tribes. We've recognized that many of the communities um, throughout South Dakota that are in tribal areas are suffering from high crime uh, rates. They're dealing with drugs and trafficking and our ability to partner with them resides solely with them signing a law enforcement agreement with the state of South Dakota. I, I hope everybody remembers that I have no jurisdiction on tribal lands that the federal government does. They are a sovereign nation and law enforcement responsibilities lie with the federal government. Um, what I called for was an audit of the amount of dollars that go to our tribes for law enforcement because I believe it's dramatically underfunded and I don't even know if what they're getting is being spent appropriately. And we have to get the truth and the facts of what these tribes are getting for money to create you know, safe communities. Uh, so that we can go then and advocate for and help them get the kind of funding that they need to hire officers to get them trained and to make sure that many of these people don't have to live with the kind of violence that they live with. So the response that I've gotten has been pretty incredible. You know, you I get tribal leadership criticizes me. You know, they, they uh, presidents and chairmen have criticized me and come out with letters against me, but the community members are so extremely grateful. We've been overwhelmed with the amount of calls and emails that we've gotten that people did just say our, our tribal government is corrupt and they are embezzling money and they are tied to the corral or the cartels and thank you for calling them out. What kind of reaction have you gotten so far in the last 48 hours ish? Yeah, you know, I would say just since yesterday, even uh, when we uh, again were, I think what really we noticed was that the Oglala Sioux tribe had a tribal council meeting. They laid off a bunch of people. They couldn't afford to keep on in their housing department. They found that of the $13 million they had in their housing department, over $12 million of it was spent just on salaries. So it wasn't going into housing and their tribal council was dealing with that. And a lot of the discussion there prompted a lot of community members to start calling my office saying, yeah, I know you called for an audit. Look at the trouble that Pine Ridge is in. Our tribe is having an issue too as well. Um, I mean, I've got, dozens of calls and emails from people, people that say, I have, I have proof of embezzlement and mismanagement of funds. The governor's telling the truth about is what happens at my tribe. Um, I'd be willing to help and tell my story. Um, another phone call came in, said Governor Nome is finally holding the tribes accountable and it's long overdue. He said that he's ready to come forward with the corruption that's happening at our tribes and we'll see. Um, another one phone call said she'd like to request a, a complete forensic audit thinks it's appropriate. There's corruption among the tribal council and tribal employees. They're covering up for each other. Um, that uh, the tribal council gave themselves a $10,000 raise. Some of them don't even live on the reservation. Um, they've embezzled large amounts of money and the funds were directly put into their own personal accounts. They mistreat their elders. Um, that the federal dollars were misappropriated and misspent. And that tribal leadership is pushing back and speaking out against the governor because the Mexican cartel are on the reservation. Um, there's several names in here that we're gonna be looking into uh, that have been given to us. It says some of the council members are the largest drug dealers on the reservation and that they personally benefit from the cartels being on the reservation. So, um, you know, another phone call message, elders are being forced out of their home. The tribe is being threatened by the tribal council to drop complaints on their houses. Um, they're scared of being retaliated that uh, this other message says they are definitely involved with the cartel and they've retaliated now against my mother and, and her home. We can confirm that there are cartel on the reservation. We have cartel harassing our family and uh, CRST police are refusing to take on our reports of elderly abuse and exploitation, stolen land and the murder that is going on. Um, more letters and emails. I mean, what, what I think is that there's strength in numbers here, people are recognizing that, you know, they have a governor here. I have nothing to, to do with this situation or no power other than just try to empower people to speak out and tell the truth of what's happening. I can do a law enforcement agreement with them, but they have tribal council members and leaders that aren't protecting these communities. And I'm so proud of the folks that are, that are reaching out. This one says that this, their tribal court exists in violation of the tribe's constitution. 
Another one said, please tell me how I can work with you not only to save my people, but all the people of South Dakota. People are becoming numb to the violence that we live with every single day. Um, this, I'm Native American, I'm from the Crow Creek Sioux Tribe. Um, I know that the cartel is working with some of the council members. I will help you with your message. I'm begging you to, to ask me to help stop the violence. I don't agree with you a lot of the time, but I want to work with you to help stop the violence because my heart is exploding with all the hurt that we live with every day. So, I mean, they've been very honest in the fact that we've had our disagreements on different policy issues in the past, but I think they know that I want to help them be safe and raise their kids in a community that's safe. And to audit these federal dollars is important so we know that it's being spent appropriately before we go back to D.C. and say that they need more to, to, to really make a difference. You know, you're not the first person ever suggested that cartels operating on the reservation. There's a report from the FBI in like the 2000s, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and certainly not the first to talk about corruption in the tribes. I, I did a story last year about Rosebud giving themselves raises. So there's, there's been a lot of, generally speaking, a lot of reporting on this. Why has this been allowed to happen for so long? Why does this happen so much? I think, you know, it, it takes political leaders holding people accountable. And the leadership at these tribes changes so often. You know, it's, I, I think just Oglala Sioux has been through two or three or four tribal presidents just since I've been governor. Um, and they vote them in and out and it's unstable. And then also they get the power to decide who they wanna punish or not punish or help or not punish. And they control all the funds that come to the reservation. So if someone's house wants to get fixed or a new roof or needs a new window, then they better get along with the tribal council to make sure that that gets funded. And that's been the, a long-standing practice. I think for me, what's been the most frustrating is that I came into the role as governor um, with my hands out saying, I want a new relationship with our tribes. Just do things differently than you have in the past and I will help you be successful, get economic development. I have state employees in IHS facilities helping with casework to make sure people are getting health care that, that you know, I don't have a responsibility to do. We just pay for it to make sure that they get some help on better health care in, in those areas. We have done more for education and Department of Health in those areas. Some of our tribes have done law enforcement agreements. Some of them we've done addiction treatment programs with. We, we, we work with them, but, but it always, the responsibility lies at their tribal council member level and their presidents and their chairman that they elect. And these community members need to make sure that they're electing leaders that are truly doing their due diligence and using these dollars in the appropriate way. It's clear they're not. Um, I'm, if we can expose the corruption, absolutely. Um, they're being manipulated right now and abused because of cartel presence as well and perpetuating more and more violence. And it's only gonna get worse unless uh, we finally have the federal government come in, do a true audit and take over and make sure that these tribes are being run to the benefit of their communities. You know, one suggestion that I saw uh, yesterday was that the, these tribes are already getting audited to some extent. What would be different about sort of your pitch, your proposal, and how would that change things? So they haven't been audited as far as are the dollars being spent appropriately to how the program is required. They're held to a different standard. So there may be some one or two programs that get audited, but not the entire tribe and all the dollars that they get. For instance, this housing program down at the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Um, that needs to be audited on the fact that they received $13 million of federal funds to use for housing. Sounds like from what was testified to at their council meeting that instead new vehicles were purchased um, for members of housing and a lot of it went to salaries and not into actual construction or repair of housing. Um, every program should be looked at, um, not just law enforcement, but, but how they spend them and do they actually help individuals that are there. And this kind of a forensic audit goes through whoever's keeping the books, whoever, wherever the money is going, this is taxpayer dollars. We have a treaty obligation at the federal government level to take care of these tribes and have a responsibility to provide education and law and order, and it's not happening today. So the federal government should care that they go in there and look at the books and make sure that we're doing due, due justice by these folks. Your mom, grandma, all those things, all these issues are affecting people, you know, boarded up houses, drugs, crime. How does that sort of personally affect you and how much does that sort of impact your desire to help solve this problem, solve these problems? It, dram it dramatically affects me because when I think about my family, I can't imagine raising my children in these 
communities. I can't imagine my grandkids going to school, being worried if they're going to make it to school that morning without hearing gunshots or being concerned about if they're safe or if there will be drugs in their classroom with them. That, that's what is um, alarming to me, is that it's happening right here in South Dakota. And that we have to, whether, whether it seems as though I'm fighting with the tribal presidents and chairmen, I'm not fighting with them, but, but they need to fix it. And they have a responsibility, and there's a responsibility that comes with leadership to address these problems so that they can be safe. And um, yeah, I, when I first became governor, I was down at Pine Ridge so often having meetings with community members and, and always inviting the tribal council to come and the president to come and they would never show up, but so many community members were starting to show up and we were talking about addiction treatment and suicide treatment. And I, I'll never forget that there was a meeting that a, a young man stood up and he said, Governor Noem, I hear lots of things about you. Um, I hear lots of bad things and, uh, and I believe they're true. He said, but you're starting to show up so much now that I'm starting to think you actually care. And it was right after that, within the next day or two, that I got banned from the reservation. So I think that they know I care. The communities know that I care and I really want to help them. It's the tribal council that is threatened by me and threatened by me being there because they know that their ability to control the money and the power will go away if we really make them use it appropriately to serve their, their people. Do you, do you think, looking at the reaction, is recently some of your comments on this audit, do you, do you think they well, are scared? Or do you, why do you think there's so much pushback from tribal council? I don't want to say tribal council, but leave, you know, tri some tribal leadership mm -hmm. to this idea. Well, I think right now they're scared because they've got a lot of people that are saying they've been embezzling, they're a part of the corruption, they're tied to the cartels, they're facilitating it. So they should be scared because um, their people are finally standing up and speaking out about what, what these tribal councils have been doing. Um, hopefully this motivates the federal government to do something to come in and to protect the community. That's, that's what needs to happen is DOJ needs to get involved, um, Interior needs to get out here, BIA, and really find out and do this audit and find out where these dollars are going. And, and if these tribal council members and the president and the chairman have been acting inappropriately. Um, I, I think the tribal council, probably there's some members that are there in, in a good way and are there and work hard and want to serve their people and work hard for them. So it's not all of them. I, I, I think there's, I meet many tribal council members that want to work together. Um, I think if you watch any of their tribal council meetings, there's a lot of arguing and discussion and back and forth. All I'm saying is, tell me how I can help. Um, I'm, I'm the governor of this state. It makes me sad that out of the top 11 or 12 poorest counties in the nation, that South Dakota has five of them, and they're all in tribal areas. So we have some of the most destitute communities in this country right here in South Dakota, and their leadership won't work with me to help improve the conditions for their people. You know, a lot of them were pretty fired up, tribal chairman that is, about comments last week or two weeks ago in winter that you made regarding, and I'm paraphrasing, yeah. uh, them being financially tied to the cartel. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want to elaborate on those remarks? And Well, the, the remarks that I made in winter um, specifically said that I believed that tribal council members or leadership was benefiting from the Thanks. presence, yeah, was benefiting from the presence of the cartel being there. Um, I still stand by those words. Um, and Can you elaborate I, on them? Well, what I would say is, you know, why did they ban me from the reservation at Pine Ridge? Why have they not banned the cartel? We've got proof that they're there. DCI knows they're there. The Attorney General, the Fusion Center. We have pictures of the banditos and the ghost dancers uh, gang being there. We know that they're there. Um, the proof is there. Why have they not banned these people that are trafficking drugs and people and violence through their communities from their reservations? Uh, that, that tells me that that they are tied to them or benefiting from them somehow, that they're there allowing them to stay in their communities, meanwhile trying to keep me out for just trying to assist and bring more safety. What, what do you make, of, again, there's a couple of them coming, President Starr comes out, uh, I think Crow Creek, the president might have came out and demanded apologies. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you make of that and have you spoken to any of those people since they started? I tried to call President, Starr comes out last night, he didn't pick up his phone. I tried to call President Herman several times. Um, uh, President Long Geek has been great in returning her calls. We've tagged back and forth a lot, so at least he tries to call me back. Most of them don't return my phone calls, but I would just say, you know, constantly, they can criticize me, 
I'm not going to apologize for telling the truth. I would ask them to prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. I'd love it, and I'll help you fix it. I don't, I don't care what the situation is. I don't care even if they throw their hands up and say, yeah, we screwed up a few things, then let, let me help you fix it so people can make progress. They can have a house that keeps their family warm. They can put food on the table. They don't have to worry about going out in the street and getting shot by cartel members. So uh, that's my door is open. I, I'm sending a letter today to the president of the Ogala Sioux asking if I can come to Pine Ridge. Can I come and meet with you and your tribal council? Let me help you with this missing money that is gone and what you're doing on housing. Um, the state is ready to do things in a new way. If they are, and if they'll, they'll come and to the table and have a discussion, let's see what we can do to be helpful. So effectively lifting the ban, I mean, that's what that would be in practice. I'd be, well, they've had lots of discussions, I know, at their council meetings on, on lifting the ban. I think President Starr comes out, has said that if I arrive on tribal land, I, he will have me arrested. Um, you know, so I've been try I've been respectful. Mm. I've been, you know, respectful of their decision and their leadership, but I do know that his community members want me to come. So no thoughts of just going down there? Well, I mean, I could. I've never been arrested before, it's but not that bad. it's not that bad. <laughs> 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 but I, you know, the community members would like for me to be there. Um, I would like to come. So again, I keep asking. I keep asking and would love to be there. Um, and I would think that for the benefit of his people, he would he would want to talk with me. If we could switch gears here just for a mm -hmm. few minutes, I want to talk about the um, disturbance last night at the uh, state penitentiary yes. in Sioux yeah. Falls. Is there any information you know that you've gotten as of this morning that you can share with us, uh, maybe about that disturbance and what's going on there? To start. Just that we had a situation at the penitentiary that uh, was handled appropriately according to protocol. I'm extremely proud of the outstanding work that our corrections officers did uh, in that situation and getting it under control and things back in order. You know, it's, it feels like, and I'm kind of watched from afar, I will admit I've not been close to the prison beat, if you will, but it feels like maybe this has kind of been boiling and simmering for a mm -hmm. while. And of course, you know, when something like this happens, you know, there was reports last night that uh, prison guards went to the emergency room, there was injury mm -hmm. suffered, etc. What needs to be done moving forward to sort of prevent this sort of situation from happening again? Well, I think anytime you're dealing with that type of a population, you always have to be prepared for any kind of a situation that might come. Uh, you know, this, this was because of some tablets that were removed from prisoners, and there's an ongoing investigation as to how those tablets were being used. Uh, the prisoners are still able to make phone calls, and they are still able to write letters and have communication with family, so we made sure that all of that was maintained and sustained while that investigation goes on. But that's what started the original conflict last night. And yes, we did have a correctional officer that was assaulted and went to the hospital. And, and I hope they're doing well today. And we'll continue to do all we can to have a safe environment. But what we need is a new prison. And I'm working on it. Um, you know, this prison and this facility is old. And it's even older than the state of South Dakota. and. We can build a safer prison that can handle these types of situations better that will keep people in a, in a more calm atmosphere when you do have any kind of situation like we faced last night. Obviously, yeah, you're, of course, working on the new prison spearheaded that funding went through, but that's still six, seven years away probably. Yes. When I'm, And that's maybe being generous at that. What needs to be done in the short term to prevent this from happening again? You never want to see someone leave enough. But well, we've, we've invested heavily in our corrections officers training uh, equipment, making sure their communication is, um, equipment is up to par and that they have the ability to have more staff as well um, to be there and always have backup and, and then have a, that training is incredibly important in a situation like that so they can fall back on that and have the kind of experience that they need to handle it. And they did do that very well last night. They followed protocol and handled it appropriately and and glad that everything is under control. With the tablets, I mean, again, it's internal. I don't know the details, I assume mm -hmm. you do to a certain extent. Do you maybe empathize with the perspective of some of these prisoners who use these tablets to contact loved ones, call home, and just have a level of sanity? And is it maybe, a, would you say that it's a priority to get those back in as short an order as possible? 
I would say that we are going to find out if it's possible to give tablets to these prisoners and not have them be used for nefarious reasons because that's why the investigation is going on. They were not being used um, in all situations to just contact home. They were being used for other purposes um, that were not good and not legal and uh, we're working with the technology and the vendor to make sure that to see if that's even a possibility. Do you empathize with the people who do just use them to call home or reach out? Oh, absolutely. And that's why we've just you know gone so far to make sure to let them know that they still have their approved list of people to call, that they have access to telephones, and they can call them just from a different method, that they'll be able to still continue to have letters back and forth. And none of those communications have been shut down. It's just that now the tablets are not going to be available to, for them to use, then be misused like we believe is happening and why the investigation is going on. It's not something I promise. I promise. Yeah. Did you ever imagine when you became governor, when you were becoming governor, that this would be as much of a thing as it is dealing with the prisons, building a new prison? Did, was this on your mind in 2017, 2018? No, 19? I remember when I first got to be elected governor, they said, what are some of the state facilities that you would like to tour first? And I said, you know, I've never been in a, prison or seen it, I probably should. I wanted to see some of the DCI building and see some of our office buildings. Um, obviously you want to familiarize, familiarize yourself. I remember going to the penitentiary and, and they had, um, they were so nervous I was there because the governor hadn't come for so long. And then I had a lot of the corrections officers telling me that they had hurried up and cleaned up things to get it ready for a governor's visit. And I bet it was 110 degrees in there and just like a sweat. I mean, they handed me a towel as I walked in. I thought, how can we expect people to come and be in our Department of Corrections and be in a facility like this and not offer them any kind of counseling or treatment? We can't even give them a humane environment because there, there was no air conditioning um, and the humidity was off the charts. And watching the inmates walk around at that point in time Know, in their underwear, checking them constantly for dehydration because of poor facilities, it was then that I decided that this had to be a priority while I was governor, that we were going to build facilities that not only were safe for our correctional officers, but they also were going to be facilities that treated our inmates like human beings and, and gave them the opportunity to, to, to actually live and, and get counseling and get a skill and a trade while they're there so that when they come out of incarceration, they have the chance to provide for their families again. I think that was good. Thanks, Governor. Okay.